give this a go again. Uh, so thank you for coming. I know this was uh, sort of late notice and uh, not a lot of lead time, but we played things fast and loose. Um, so this is a workshop on preventing plagiarism through assignment design. And I assume that both of you are probably here because you've encountered that. Like what you were just saying, you had Nora, you run into plagiarism often, often, yes. Uh, I know, right, English and, well, wow. You're running into it now in, in this well, time. I got it in Unit 101. That makes I, sense. I did get it in biology lab for uh, one of the books. Yes, one comes too. All right. It does show up everywhere. Uh, and if you want to feel some solidarity, you should know that you are not alone. Um, a study that was done over the course of three years in the early 2000s found that about a third of college undergraduates will plagiarize at some point or another in their college career. Now the good news from this study is that most of them are small, right? It's paraphrasing or copying a couple of sentences without footnoting. Uh, only 3% are admitting to buying something from a paper mill. Uh, or the more egregious one. But we don't want that easy stuff either. We don't want the small scale stuff to happen either. Um, so what kinds of plagiarism are you finding in your courses? Because there's a lot of different types of plagiarism. Most commonly internet sources, overwhelmingly Sparknotes or Schmoop.com. Well, they're making it easy for you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, that's about what I found. Yeah. Um, uh, or in some cases, working together. Sure. Uh, and it's, you can tell the, the wording is very close. It's right, it's close. close. Okay. Now, in the case of biology, would those be, say, lab group partners that turn into assignments that sound similar? Yes. Okay. So you're encouraging them to work together for part of the yeah, work. For the experiment, right. but not for the paper. Right. But somehow they're turning in suspiciously similar papers. I had one case last semester where it was um, about 99% sure that the student was having her cousin write her papers for her and had no absolute proof of this. Well, that's frustrating, right? Yes, you have to be able to prove that. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm amused that you were able to identify that it was a cousin, too. Uh, well, she screen. sort of disclosed it. She said, I had a, I have a cousin who's an English teacher and she helped. Absolutely uh, refused to say what this help consisted of, but denied that it extended to actual writing. Right. I'm pretty sure that it did. Yes, that fine line between proofreading uh, an essay and fixing yes. an essay, or helping, as you say, with an essay, is, is something that's challenging to, to read with them. So you're certainly seeing different types. Um, do you treat them all the same? Do you treat the person who's blatantly copied something off of the internet the same as, say, somebody whose work seems a little close to somebody that you know they've collaborated with, or to somebody who maybe you can tell missed a citation, right? In the paper that's otherwise pretty well documented, they missed one. Um, what do you do in those cases? I'd say that for me, kind of the line is, are they taking text from the source, word for word, with no quotation marks, or a significant Usually, uh, if it is a case of um, paraphrased plus missing citations, I tend to treat that as if you know, they're not understanding what their responsibilities are. Whereas if it's um, blatant copying, I tend to treat it as flat out plagiarism. So what's your mind? Yeah, I, I follow pretty much the same. If it's, if it's a word for word, that is that's something I'd like to uh, take correction with. But uh, the paraphrasing of the source, but it's close enough that I could Google and find it, or in well, this case last semester, I know you're an international student. There's no way you can use the word whom correctly. <laughs> um, and that's what tipped me off to go find the paragraph. Now, it had been modified, and so I, I assume first semester freshman, in this case, you may not hear and understand what plagiarism I try to talk to them, uh, unless it's a way I have cheated by copying them. Okay, good. So it sounds like you're already differentiating between some of the more extreme and milder, I guess I would say, forms of plagiarism. Um, and I really like what I'm hearing about seeing the, the more mild cases as an opportunity for education uh, and further training as opposed to immediate reprimand and sending them up to the provost's office, um, which, which is good. Yeah, when I see it overwhelmingly in sophomore wet, um, not so much for freshmen, actually. I think it's partly because freshmen have actually had that stuff in comp class. They're on the same page, more or less. And sophomore wet, they get community college students who take me in 101 and all kinds of different places.
places, it's really hard to tell exactly how much they come in now. How much they come in now. And that, I think, is the common problem for a lot of us. We assume knowledge that they don't have. I, I do treat plagiarism and cheating and other forms differently because I feel like plagiarism can be done unintentionally, whereas if you have a cheat sheet or you're copying off someone else, that's so blatant. Plagiarism is very easy to do for those mild cases. That's it. Right, and I agree entirely, right? So somebody bringing in a cheat sheet to an exam scenario is very different from somebody uh, accidentally doing a poor job of summarizing a source yes. uh, and, and not paraphrasing them appropriately or giving credit when they paraphrase. Right. So that brings me to my next question then. Why do you think it is that your students do this? getting lost by the secondary previous week. Uh, so why do you think your students play your eyes? Say I'm alone, it's never the good students, or perhaps those are the ones who just know how to do it so that they don't get caught. <laughs> I think you know, a lot of times it's a matter of being asked to do something that they don't really know how to do, and not seeing that as a growth opportunity, but rather basically going into a panic. Okay, so panic from lack of preparation. Um, and so you're seeing mostly the, the weaker students with less skill base doing this, or at least doing a worse job than the students who know how to cover it better. I would also say a lack of confidence in okay. themselves and being able to analyze something or put together thoughts of their own. Absolutely. Those are both very, very common reasons. Um, and there's actually, there's a whole host of reasons students plagiarize. So I think those are two of the biggest ones on our campus. It's lack of preparation and lack of confidence in their skills. Um, either because they actually lack those skills or because they've been told that they lack those skills, um, which is sometimes the harder one to eradicate. Um, but there are actually more, right? And there are some that perhaps you haven't thought of or some that maybe we don't see as often. And I just want to talk about some of them because to prevent plagiarism, we need to be able to understand why they're doing it, right? So the first one that usually comes up when we do surveys of students about why did you plagiarize is I just didn't care. It's lack of interest. Um, and that lack of interest usually comes about because they view the assignment as busy work. They don't see why it's important. Um, it's not something that I need to spend time on. It's not worth my time. My other classes are more important. I just don't care. Sometimes that's because it's a gen ed class and it's outside their major and they just don't see the point. Sometimes it's because uh, the professor clearly doesn't read their work carefully. So over the course of the semester, they just stop trying. Right? If you do regular small assignments and you don't show any evidence of having read them, um, then they start saying, what's the point of doing it? I'm just going to copy a paragraph off the internet, turn it in. He just reads it to see that there's something there, so he cares, and that's good enough for me. So lack of interest to do it. So can lack of investment. Um, and I like to differentiate these two because they're coming from a different place. Right? Lack of interest is about feeling like it's not worth the effort. Lack of investment is that I don't even care about the material. Right? I don't care to be in this course. Um, this isn't relevant to my degree, right? This is a gen ed class in psychology, and I'm a business major, and I don't see the point of it. Or the material that we're studying, I don't understand how it helps, so why should I waste my time? Um, usually, in this case, the student can't understand how the assignment helps prepare them for the next phase in their education or in their career goals. They just don't see that connection at all. Uh, and this actually also can come back to a lack of intellectual curiosity, right? What we're trying to get after with the QEP that intellectual curiosity, if a student just doesn't care about learning for learning's sake, then they're not going to bother doing assignments when they don't see that value. Another one uh, that we commonly see, which has been mentioned already, is that fear of failure. Right? I am not prepared to handle that, and I am not prepared to fail. Um, this comes up a lot, say, with scholarship students. If my GPA doesn't stay at a minimum threshold, I lose my scholarship and I am so afraid that I don't know how to do this assignment that I'm going to cheat and hope I don't get caught so that I hopefully get that A or B this paper is supposed to get me instead of risking getting a C or D by doing my own work. Uh, same thing for a student who knows that uh, their grades define how much money their parents are going to give them, their family's going to give them for continuing education, or for a student who's coming up against their deadline for Pell eligibility. Uh, and needs to pass this class because they need the credits to graduate and just doesn't have the time or energy to take care of doing it the right way. They'd rather have that sure thing uh, from a bought paper or from a paper that they feel like they've sourced relatively well on the internet than trying their own. 
but next one then of course is the lack of skills or the lack of ability um which which also um you guys identified as something you see in our students a lot this might be a student who was under prepared by their high school or their community college or by previous classes here right to handle the workload that they're encountering in your classroom um sometimes they don't recognize that they're under prepared until they're in the thick of it it's too late sometimes they recognize that they're under prepared but they're too embarrassed to ask for help uh, and so rather than ask for help, they just sort of fake it. This is also where I put those students that suffer from writing phobia. Like they're scared of writing, either because they know that they're a weak writer because they haven't had training and they didn't do things. I mean, this way, I think we've seen some changes in secondary education that have hurt uh, preparation level for college readiness. Writing, um, I know that I have spoken with at least one of our recent graduates who's teaching in the high school system now who says that she she teaches English at a mid high school level. She is not allowed to assign long essays. And by long essays, I mean something longer than a page. So the students get to us and they have no knowledge of how to organize or conceptualize a three to five page paper because they've never written anything longer than two or three paragraphs. Uh, so they're just not prepared to handle it. That phobia of writing might also come from a teacher who has said something to them previously. Where did you learn to write like that? Oh my God, who taught you? Uh, you know, this is atrocious, come see me. And that might be a student who previously thought that they were a strong writer, they get a comment like that on a paper. Instead of coming in to see you, they react badly, they go into hiding, uh, and they then carry that with them to all their future classes and don't want to seek out help. And now they know I'm a bad writer, so I'm not even gonna try, I'm just gonna cheat. Uh, and hope that I can get away with it. The next common one is one I think we all suffer from, uh, procrastination, time management. It's a serious issue. Uh, our students have a procrastination problem. I think most of our faculty, myself included, have a procrastination problem. Uh, we all understand this one, right? Sometimes it seriously is just procrastination. Sometimes it's that the student honestly didn't expect how long that it would take to do this project. They've never written a five-page paper before. They didn't realize how long it would take, so they started, didn't have enough time to finish it, so they panicked, grabbed something off the internet, and turned it in. Uh, similarly, you might have students who are overextended. As you well know, a lot of our students work full-time. They have families they're caring for. Uh, they're perhaps heavily involved in social club activities. Their time is very limited. They take probably more credits than we would like them to be taking in a given semester to try to get through as quickly as possible. And that leaves them not enough time to really sit and work on assignments until the last minute. At that point, students know they could ask for an extension, but they might be afraid to because they're embarrassed that it was their poor planning that got them there. Or they know that your syllabus says you know, absolutely no extensions will be granted except for extreme medical emergencies. And well, you know, my poor planning is not a medical emergency. Um, sometimes you get the students who actually did have a legitimate emergency, but they're too ashamed to tell you that they did, so they don't ask for an extension. All of these things can lead to a student plagiarizing just out of desperation at that 11th hour. This is the one that I think is the hardest to combat, the, the lack of fear of consequences. This is the student that says, I don't care if I get caught. I'm just going to plagiarize it. If I get caught, I get caught. So what? Um, they have done the cost-benefit analysis and decided it's worth the risk. They really don't care. Um, sometimes this comes from a place where they think that as a university as a whole, or perhaps uh, individual faculty get reputations for not enforcing their plagiarism policies. You know, oh yeah, she's got a policy in her syllabus, but you know, I heard from my friend she never enforces it, right? Like, so uh, yeah, she even called my roommate out on it one year in a paper, but she didn't turn it. Right, so uh, there's no reason for me not to plagiarize with this person because they never check, they don't really care. Other people get a thrill out of beating the system, so it's like a game for them, right? Hopefully I can beat the whole thing and I'll get through this class and I'll get a B and I worked on a lick of work and it's going to be great and I'm going to brag about it for you know, the next 20 years that I, that I got away with that. This also, though, can come from cultural differences, and this is something that's particularly a risk for um, international student populations from certain countries. In some cultures, it is seen as less bad to plagiarize than to get a poor grade. It is more acceptable to plagiarize in order to get a good grade than it is to do your own work and get the bad grade. And that's a cultural expectation that I think we generally don't think about. We, we operate in a very guilt-based culture uh, here in the United States, and you should feel guilty if you plagiarize because you're cheating and you're not doing your own work. Um, that's not true for some places. 
so we get that cultural dissonance going on sometimes with some of our population. And then the last reason, which I frankly think is one of the more common ones, is that they really just didn't understand they were plagiarizing in the first place. Um, certainly buying something from a paper mill is pretty clear. It's cut and dry. I don't think anyone knows that's not cheating. But other parts of plagiarism, as we've said, some of those milder cases, they're highly variable. It's really hard to tell if you're plagiarizing or not. And that's true even for students that do pay attention because what one discipline defines as plagiarism, another discipline may not. So you know, I'm a biology major and I go take an English class and all of a sudden what I thought was perfectly acceptable summary is considered plagiarism. And I had no idea. I was following the conventions that I had been taught. So what they also, in this case, I think often suffer from poor training in high school. Right? Some high schools, uh, out of desperation, are not teaching them to source cor correctly or to cite correctly, or are, in fact, in some cases, teaching them the way that you write a paper is you go out and you assemble facts and you summarize things and you put one citation at the end and it's good. And that's what they've been taught to do. And I've had students tell me that here, and I believe them. They honestly were shocked to find out that was not appropriate. Um, here again, cultural differences may play a role as well. Uh, there are some educational cultures where they believe that undergraduate students should not be framing their own arguments, should not be criticizing other sources. They're, they're too much of a novice in the field. Your job as an undergraduate is to collect information from exer experts, compile it, uh, summarize it, and understand it. And then when you get to graduate school, you can start doing the kind of synthesis and analysis that we want to see. Um, so they are, frankly, flabbergasting when we're telling them, no, you need to like pull that apart and tease it out and tell me what you think. That's not what they're saying to you. That's a lot of reasons why students do this thing that for a lot of faculty, we really just sit there and say, well, why in the world are you doing this to me? Right? Why are you causing me to have to do this paperwork at the end of the semester when I'm so busy and I don't want to do it? Um, we've all been there. All right? and we've all sort of said, well, we'll just let this one slide. Friday and grades are due Monday, and I don't have time to get all the stuff in the row. So there's good news. Uh, don't panic, right? Do not despair entirely. Uh, because remember that for all that you do see plagiarism cases, the vast majority of your students are not plagiarizing. And I know I told you that a third of college students will plagiarize over the course of their careers at the start of this discussion, but they're not doing it on every assignment. Right? They're doing it once. They're maybe doing it twice. They're not doing it consistently. So most of the time, you're not seeing it. The other good news is that there are strategies that you can implement that will help to slow this down, to reduce the likelihood of unintentional plagiarism, and to help um, with those that just don't care. Probably the hardest category to reach is that category of the people that just want to game the system and see if they can get away with it. Those are the hardest ones to hit, although I have a, a strategy to try to hit them too. But the ones that are just not invested, the ones that just honestly don't understand, the ones that don't have the experience, the background, the training, the support, those we can help. Uh, and those same strategies that will help prevent plagiarism from those students will also turn them into stronger writers, will also help them learn the material better. It's all around a win win. This is good for everything. So, how do we define or so how do we prevent that plagiarism? There's four ways that I'm going to talk about today uh, about how to prevent plagiarism or at least reduce the level of plagiarism. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me any time. Uh, we should be as conversational as you want. Uh, those are to define plagiarism clearly up front, first thing in your syllabus and in class, and give them examples. That is, give them examples of what is plagiarism and what is not for your discipline. The second one is designing plagiarism resistant assignments. Then we need to go into what to do when you evaluate plagiarism cases and differentiate between the ones that are really hardcore plagiarism and the ones that look like they're just accidental misuse and misattribution of sources. And then finally, following through with consequences when you do encounter actual plagiarism. So let's start with the first one, which is defining plagiarism. Um, here again, we've got to have this problem. What does plagiarism mean? You know what plagiarism means in your field. You've been versed in this for years. You went to graduate school. You can see plagiarism a mile away. Your students have no idea. Uh, they know that plagiarism generally means taking somebody else's work and presenting it as their own, but often they don't think they're doing that. And this comes down again also to that disciplinary difference, right? I learned how not to plagiarize in my field, but then I go and take a course in another discipline, and all of a sudden I'm plagiarizing, and I have no idea why I'm doing it. 
so this goes a long way, right? so it's even in terms of how you organize papers. so let's say you were writing a paper for a political science class. they expect you by convention to do a literature survey and review in the first part of the paper. um they expect you to show that work and give it all up front. if you go into say an english class, they expect you to still do that work, but to kind of bury the work within the body of the paper and bring it up as it's appropriate. if a student was trained in the english manner and then went and wrote a paper in a political science class, the faculty member in that course might think that they're trying to hide and conceal where they got their information from by not presenting it all up front in the first place uh, and therefore be suspicious of the students plagiarizing when in fact they're just writing in the way they've been trained to write the paper. Sometimes different faculty use things differently even within the same program. Right? My definition of plagiarism might not be the same as other colleagues within my discipline. I might even change my conventions course to course. Right? Um, the way that I require students to cite materials in my general education 100 level history surveys is different than the way I require them to cite material in my three and 400 level seminars because I expect a different level of detail and a different level of convention, uh, you know, actually using the right citation style, uh, using footnotes appropriately versus in the 100 level, we're using common source material and I let them use parenthetical citations. So I do things differently within my own class. Do you let them use class notes in their writing? How do you define what's common knowledge in your fields? All of these things get in the way of figuring things out. We do have one common source. I don't know the last time that you read the W's actual definition of what plagiarism is. Um, you can find this in the undergraduate bulletin online. And it's clear, right? It's taking somebody else's ideas, facts, phrases, or additional materials from any source without giving proper credit or appropriate documentation. But it's so broad that it's, it's, it's functionally not helpful, right? And that's good because it's covering all the various disciplines. What that means is that just copying and pasting this into your syllabus is not going to tell your students what you expect. This isn't far enough. It doesn't tell them what you want from them to not commit plagiarism according to the parameters of your field and for this particular course that you are teaching at this level. So. The best thing to do then in that case, by all means, start from the W's definition of plagiarism, but take some time at the beginning of your class to explain what plagiarism is for the purposes of this class, for your field. Um, usually that's going to take part right on that dreaded first day uh, where we all go through the syllabus, um, but you know, it's a conversation that really should extend further than that. It's worth bringing up again when you hand out the next paper assignment. Right? Let's talk again about what this means in terms of source documentation. How should you be taking notes as you go forward to make sure that you don't forget, you know, a month later where that came from? Was that your word that you used as you took notes, or were you actually copying from the book and you forgot to put quotation marks around it as you went, and now you can't remember a month later if that was your voice or the author of the articles? Um, that kind of thing you need to address regularly as you go on. You also should take some time um, to talk about the reasoning behind your plagiarism policy. So it's not just, don't do plagiarism because it's bad and it's cheating and it's against the W's policy. Right? That's true, but that's not the whole story. This is one of those moments when breaking down that fourth wall and sort of going to a discussion of why these things matter, why we say that plagiarism is such a harsh academic offense is important. So don't just say, here's what plagiarism is, here's what my punishment policy is. If you get caught plagiarizing, don't do it, end of story, move on. Um, instead, maybe take some time to say, okay, what do you lose when you plagiarize? Right? What, what are the consequences when you do this? Um, yeah, I should say up front, don't feel bad if you do this. I've done this for years. So I just said, here's my plagiarism policy, you all know what it is, don't do it, end of story. You don't need to talk about this because you're all great people, you're not going to do it. And then, lo and behold, I get plagiarism throughout the semester. Not huge amounts, but you know, the regular small level stuff and the occasional rip from the internet stuff. Um, changing this made a big difference for me. It's a lot less plagiarism. So we talk about why, right? What are you doing to yourself when you plagiarize? When you plagiarize, you hurt the value of your degree and the degrees of all your peers who have ever graduated from this institution because you're saying that it's okay for W students to cheat. That hurts the reputation of our degrees. It also hurts you as a student. It hurts your development. You're not actually learning the skills that you're here to learn. You're not growing. It's tough. Absolutely, it's tough to write a paper, to learn how to synthesize, to learn how to manage all of this disparate information and condense it and turn it into an argument or turn it into something helpful. But you should struggle with that now instead of when you're out in a job and 
your employer expects you to be able to do that because you have a bachelor's degree from the W, and that implies a certain amount of ability. So learn it now. The goal of learning how to research and write beyond that, why do we require that for somebody to graduate with a BA degree or a BS degree? We require that because we want our citizenry to be informed. Right? We want you to be able to read and analyze things, to understand the underlying messages, to be persuasive in your arguments when you try to tell someone what you believe and why. Uh, we want you to be more thoughtful. We want you to be engaged in the world around you. And if you plagiarize and cheat now, you are hurting yourself in the long run because you're not developing those skills. You're not practicing those skills. Moreover, I as a professor, I want to know what you think. I don't care what the experts think. I can read them too. I don't care what some random guy on the internet that you found thinks. I want to know what you think based on your reading of the material, our discussions here in class, where does this like you to go? Usually some combination of that, showing them why it's valuable, showing them that you care what they think is enough for some, at least, to give, get them past that issue of, I don't care, right? I don't care about the assignment, I'm not invested in the assignment, um, and I'm just gonna cheat on it because it's busy. Another thing that's helpful here is something that it sounds like both of you are already doing, for which I applaud you. And that is distinguishing between plagiarism and failure to adequately source your material, right? failure to acknowledge the sourcing of your material. Um, and for that, um, I found a really, really useful distinction from this group, which is the, uh, the writing Pro Council of Writing Program Administrators. It's a group that um, basically helps writing program administrators uh, do their job. And they talked about how plagiarism usually fails to distinguish between actual plagiarism, right? Taking someone else's text and attempting to use it as your own, which is clearly plagiarism and then carelessly or inadequately citing ideas while you were going along, either because you were sloppy or because you honestly didn't know you were supposed to plagiarize it, or not to plagiarize it, uh, or how to summarize it, something along those lines. This group makes the point that completing those is problematic because an ethical writer makes every effort to acknowledge where they're coming from, but we all make mistakes. And these are our students. They're supposed to be making mistakes. That's how you learn. You make a mistake, you correct it, and you try not to do it again. So our goal should not be to blanket punish them necessarily for all instances of plagiarism. If you are clear and precise in your instructions about what is plagiarism and what is not, um, and how you expect things to be cited, when they make a mistake in a citation that you don't think is deliberate plagiarism, give them a chance to fix it. That will lead to better outcomes eventually. So the overall point here is be clear, precise, and upfront about what your definition of plagiarism is. Don't assume that they know what plagiarism is just because they're a college student, even if they're a senior. Don't assume they know because we can't necessarily be sure that they've had somebody take the time to explain it before or explain it for your field or for what you're doing in that course. Have a concrete syllabus code that's outlined there in black and white to make sure that they see it on the first day, but also come back to it every once in a while as you introduce new assignments to remind them and then show them examples. Right. In the early parts of class in the first couple weeks, throw up a couple examples. Right? You all read that article last night that we're going to be discussing today. Here's two previous anonymous student summaries of it. Right? Which one would you say was well done? Which one would you say borders on plagiarism? Right? Have them look at it and then ask them why they chose this one versus that one. You know, walk them through a couple examples. It's a lot easier to see something. Uh, it's going back to that whole thing of right, um, pornography. Right? I know it when I see it. Uh, they don't like that definition coming from us. Show them some examples, they'll see it. It's a lot easier once you've seen it uh, to understand how you're supposed to do this. Right. Moving on from that point then, let us talk about how to design plagiarism resistant assignments. This is the nuts and bolts about how to try to keep them from doing it. Um, note that this is not plagiarism proof assignments. Right? This is plagiarism resistance assignments. There is sadly no such thing as a plagiarism proof assignment. I wish there were. Uh, well, I guess they're probably, no, there is a, people can lie about that just so they commit like a personal diary entry, but they can still totally go and drop that off the internet. Um, in fact, I know that they do, because I know someone who has a blog, and one of their most highly uh, searched blog posts is something about like, a, it's a story about their cousin's wedding, and the only reason that she could come up with why that gets searched so often is that students are out there plagiarizing for a assignment where they're supposed to be talking about going to a family wedding. Uh, and <laughs> I can't even write about that. Um, 
yeah, so everything, everything is eligible. So following these techniques will not make you plagiarism proof, but it will make it more difficult for students to plagiarize, and it will also disincentivize plagiarism because it will give them more ownership, more interest, more involvement in the assignments, and make them actually want to do them. Uh, and then consequently they actually learn more, uh, which is also a bonus for all of us. So, starting with that, develop meaningful assignments. What do I mean by meaningful assignments? Uh, the goal here is to make students explore ideas deeply, make them develop their own arguments, uh, to avoid predictable, trite, sort of canned assignments, right? Uh, the canned assignments are easy. They're so easy, right? So what were the causes that led up to World War II, and how does that tie to the end of World War I? If somebody that teaches World War II, that is such an easy paper assignment to give. The problem is, everybody else in the world who has ever taught World War II has thought of that assignment too. There are oodles of exam or essays out there on the internet that somebody can take for that. Even if there are essays, there are oodles of sites that talk about that out there that they can go grab paragraphs from, mash together, and create an essay. So if you use a very obvious, non-specific question like that, you're making it very easy for them to find free or cheap papers on the internet. This also contributes to students' lack of interest because it looks like busy work to them, right? This is the same essay question my high school teacher assigned me. How is this different? Why should I bother? I'm just going to use that paper and add a couple more paragraphs so it meets the page length. Consider instead topics that might help your students connect on a personal level to something or connect to class material. So for example, if you can find a way to tie your topic to something that's going on current events in the news, uh, or something that's happening in your local community, that makes it harder to cheat in the first place because nobody out there has probably written pieces uh, on what's happening currently as a current event. Uh, and it's very unlikely that somebody has written about the experience of people living in Columbus, Mississippi engaging with this event. Right? So if you bring it to a local or a personalized or a current issue that can help you get that way. Um, as a, you can also, uh, for example, if you don't want to do that, sometimes it's not possible. But you'd be surprised how often I did. I saw a great assignment once of somebody who was doing, um, it was an introduction to gender studies and women's studies course. And she asked them to imagine that they were a Martian. And they were supposed to, for a month, pick one media source, right? TV, uh, internet blogs, newspapers, whatever, magazines, whatever it was, and just pay attention for a month to stories about the presentation of women or gender roles and take notes and then write up a report as an intelligent Martian uh, that explains how gender roles work in the United States based on what you've observed in this media. Sounds like a very basic thing, right? Analyze how the media presents gender and what that means for the United States, but by tying it to this one month period, you have to look at actual things that are happening now. So you can't replicate semester to semester what's going on uh, because your source material. Another way to do this is to let students choose their own essay topics. This is a favorite one of mine. So you give them parameters, right? It has to be a topic related to the course that we're doing. You might have date limits, you might have content limits, you might have subject limits, but let them choose their own way to approach. That gives them ownership, makes them feel invested. It also generally leads to better papers because they're actually genuinely interested in the question. Um, you know, I, I found it much more exciting to read papers written by students who care about the topic than to read papers by students who really could not care less about the topic. Um, that does tend to freak them out, though, uh, as a warning. A lot of them will panic. They're used to having topics handed to them. Some of them will come to you and say, just give me a topic. You have to hold the line, uh, and you have to show them how to find a topic. Many of them have not done that. So be prepared, if you do that, to have to teach them how to land on a topic, how to ask a question, how to start narrowing their focus and coming up with a thesis statement from that. Another way you can go uh, is to build a course around a theme. So, you know, let's say in biology, right? Let's say you wanted to take an environmental awareness hack, uh, even though it was Bio 101, we're going to focus on this issue of environmental awareness or climate change or whatever you want to do. And so everybody feels like they've got a common grounding and a sort of base level of knowledge. So it takes away that fear of, I have no idea where to start. I don't know anything about this subject. I'm going to pick my own thing to look at related to climate change but I have a basic understanding that I know everybody else in the class does. We've agreed on what common knowledge is. I know where I'm starting, and now I feel safe to take that next step and start looking into one smaller piece of it on my own. 
Another thing that you can do uh, if you want to try to build a meaningful assignment is to, again, pull down that fourth wall and let students understand why you're assigning this to them in the first place. That helps immensely. If students see the value of the assignment, and if that value is real, then they are a lot more willing to do the work. I understand that doing this will help me to build the skills I need to succeed in my capstone class. I'm going to do it. If I understand that learning how to do this will prepare me for the business world because I will know how to write this kind of report or to do this kind of summary uh, work, then I'm going to do it because I can see the payoff. If the only requirement is that I told you to do it and it's worth 25% of your grade, then I'm less inclined to do it because I don't see why I should bother. Right? Uh, this is also a good point to mention that if you go to tell your students why they have to do the assignment and you find that you can't come up with an actual reason for how it prepares them for future work or how it prepares them to uh, you know, do work in you know, the university or outside of the university, then it might be time to rethink that assignment. Uh, if it's not actually serving a purpose, that's probably a sign that um, you should rethink it and we can sit down together and try to come up with something that's a little more helpful and meaningful. So beyond developing meaningful assignments, another thing that you can do that is very, very helpful uh, is to build skills through small, frequent assignments that build toward the larger whole towards the end of the semester. Um, this is usually called scaffolding or laddering, but you're developing the student as you go so that they don't have to tackle one giant elephant. Instead, they take on a hoof, and then they take on a tail, and they take on a trunk, and they go ahead and piece by piece. <coughs> maybe even months, uh, and you have the students turn in small pieces regularly, even though at the end they will have a large piece that they turn into you all at once. Uh, and I just want to give you a couple of examples of how I've done this in some of my classes. Um, this is an average sort of three or 400 level course. Um, this is a course that's for our majors that's introducing them to how to do research in the field. Right? So it's slightly different, but very similar. So I'll have them turn in an initial topic very shortly after I introduce the assignment. Even if the assignment isn't due until our last meeting of the semester, I'll usually give it to them within the first three weeks of class. And I'll have them give me an initial topic idea two weeks later. And they're thinking, it's not due for like two months, two and a half months. Why am I giving you a topic? You're giving me a topic because we need to do all these other things. Um, if it's just a normal average 300 level course, I'll give them a quick 10 minute intro to how to use the library along with contact info. Um, so how to use databases, how to use interlibrary loan, and tell them to come to me if they have any trouble. I'll have them submit an initial research question and annotated bibliography a little while after that. The point of doing the annotated bibliography is they have to have actually thought about how the sources will help them. Right? Not just, here's a bunch of sources that seem to have my topic in the title, but you have to have looked at it enough to say, this will help me argue this, this will help me understand this, this will help me link this to this. After that, they have to have a consultation with me. Um, the consultation might be an email, it might be face-to-face, -face, uh, it might be informal after class, uh, it might be me chasing down the last few stragglers and making them come see me during office hours, but they have to talk to me. Um, after that, we have class check-ins once in a while. So we're still moving on with our regular course content, regular course readings, but every once in a while, just 10 minutes, how's everybody doing, anybody hitting any snags, how's the progress going. Um, shortly after midterm, I will ask everybody to explain what their new research question is, right? how it's evolved, uh, what their current thesis is, what they think their thesis will be, and sort of introduce their topic to the entire class so that everybody knows what everyone else is working on. That gives them a chance to get some feedback from their peers and not just me, uh, but it also gives them a chance to hear, oh, you're working on something related to me, so that book I couldn't find, maybe you have it. Or, as has happened, um, I read something that might actually be really helpful to you. Let me give you that reference. <coughs> and ties it along that A few weeks after that, maybe three weeks out from the final deadline, I'll make them have a draft due. And that draft will have a minimum page requirement, but it has no maximum. I have a standing policy that if you give me the full paper, I will comment and mark up the full paper and give it back to you, and we can make all those changes and they return it to me. Uh, so far in my seven years of college-level teaching, one student has taken advantage of that. Uh, but, you know, bravo to her. Um, for the most part, they just can do the minimum draft, but that still gives you a chance to check in, make sure they're moving. Then the final draft is due, and then I always, on that last day, when they bring the final draft into class that day, uh, make them go around again and just do a short, informal, three to five minutes. 
here's what my thesis ended up being, here's the basis of my argument, here's two or three really cool, interesting things I found, and here's how it relates to what we said in the class. So they're giving all of these chances to talk about it all semester. <coughs> The only difference in my more research methods focused class is that I add a few more steps that I think would be useful uh, that you could use in other classes as well. I make them after the bibliography phase, but before we get to drafting phase, do critical reviews of multiple sources, a secondary source article, a secondary source book, a primary source. Um, and these are critical reviews, right? This is not just summary. And this is where you come into an important step. A lot of, how many times have you received a paper um, that's supposed to be an analysis of something and it's really just a summary of something with a lot of quotations and no analysis, right? Um, this is where you can address that. So the instructions for these assignments are very clear. This is a three-page paper. You get two paragraphs to summarize the content of this article. After that, you will be focusing on how the, uh, how the author of the article organized and structured their argument and what methodology they used and why they used that and do you think it succeeded and is that something that will be useful to you. Uh, or you'll be looking at how did they use their source material, right? Did they use their sources fairly? Were there any source bases they left out that you think they should have addressed? Are there any flags raised for you of how they use their sources? With the primary source, how are you going to use this? Is this going to be helpful? What tools do you need to help you use this to the best of your ability? And in each of those assignments, the last piece of their paper, they have to explain how has this changed how you're approaching your, pro your problem, how are you going to further develop your problem, are you going to drop this piece, are you going to add more pieces, uh, where are you going next? So making them think and reflect the whole way through how do you do this project. That kind of scaffolding makes it harder for students to cheat. Um, for one thing, they're doing lots and lots of work, and you're seeing it all along it constantly. So if all of a sudden they change their topic in the last week of the semester and they turn in a full, you know, 16 page paper to you uh, with a week's notice, that maybe should raise some red flags on um, the topic that's shifted that quickly. Spreading the work out also gives them a lot of time to become invested in it, right? So I get really invested doing all of this. I want to know what the payoff is. I want to know what I'm going to find. I'm really excited about it. By the time I get to that, let's share what we've learned at the end piece, people are just like, I can't stop them. Uh, I've had to start like, cutting people off because they just want to keep talking about all the amazing stuff they have. And it's so fantastic to see that. Uh, but it really helps them take ownership of the piece, and that's going to make them less inclined to plagiarize because they're excited about what they've learned. To make this work, though, you have to actually make them do it. Uh, and that means that you have to actually hold them accountable for turning in all the little pieces. Uh, that means that you have to make it worth something. And I know you're now thinking, oh, about the grading, the grading of doing all of this stuff. You have to make it worth something, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to grade a lot. Um, you can make it credit, no credit. Uh, you can tie all of these pieces you have done into the grade for that final big paper. Uh, so if you missed any of the steps along the way, you get deducted a certain number of points from the final paper instead. Or I don't accept the paper if you've missed a certain number. Right? If you miss more than three of these, I will not accept your final paper. Uh, so you better turn them in as we go. Um, you can do peer review, right? As I've got built into some of these. You have to always give them feedback because the point is they should be learning as they're going along. I look at their bibliography not just for content and suggestions about source material, but also for are you correctly formatting these bibliographic entries, right? You give them that feedback as you go along, but the in-class check-ins, they're getting feedback from their peers as well as from me. It's not always just me. Or I'll have them workshop in the other class. They bring in revised thesis statements and research questions. They workshop with each other. And I, I move around and I can be flagged down, but I don't see those. They get feedback from each other because that's part of their training to evaluate them. You must give feedback as you go, but it doesn't have to be onerous, and it saves you so much time on the back end because you don't have to go and try to find the sources for this plagiarized paper uh, from a class of 15 students at the end of the semester. So doing this, as I said, helps in many ways. For one, it helps the procrastinators. They can't procrastinate if you have all these mini deadlines stacked up all semester long. They can still procrastinate, but not a bad thing. They've got a place to start from. Each step is something they have to do anyway, which means that it cuts down on that frustration about busy work. Yeah, it seems like busy work to correctly annotate a bibliography, but then my bibliography is already done for when I go and do my paper at the end of the semester, so it's not really as bad as when I might have been just a random assignment. It makes the research and writing process clearer for students who don't know how to do it. 
I don't know how to do a research paper. I don't know how to write a long essay. I don't know how you organize and frame and plan them. If I make you do the small steps as we go, I'm teaching you experientially how to do this process. And then finally, as I said, this creates investment and ownership of the project, so I'm less likely to cheat uh, as I go forward. Another way that you can try to prevent or at least reduce plagiarism uh, is to be clear and upfront with the instructions, right? Give clear instructions for the assignment. Be clear about what comes to plagiarism and what doesn't. Uh, be clear what has to be cited and what doesn't, right? Um, be clear that this is not a summary, this is an analysis, and here's what that means. Right? Tell them what you expect from them. Anticipate students' knowledge gaps and meet them where they are. Give them the skills, training that they need. It's going to take some trial and error to figure out where that line is for your classes, and every semester will be slightly different. Um, but in general, it's, it's easy to get a feel for this. Um, and to slowly generate for yourself a nice collection of handouts or outlines or other materials that you can distribute to students. Um, having a library of online resources is also good, places you can send them for further help. The Writing Center is really great for that. Um, the places you can send them when they need work. The last thing that I want to suggest to you for developing plagiarism resistant assignments is giving them low stakes practice. By low stakes, I mean value of the assignment. So a high stakes assignment is that final research paper that's worth 35% of your grade. A low stakes assignment is uh, turning in a one paragraph summary of an article that's worth five points. Okay, that's a low stakes assignment. In class assignments work really well here, but you could also do any of these as an out class assignment as well uh, if you don't want to spend the time. But doing it in class is really nice because that prevents the uh, cousin issue, right? If I do this in class writing practice, that I get to know your writing style and I make you write some stuff on this project and then you maybe don't use your notes uh, when you get home. So you can do, for example, practice summarizing a source in three sentences and then cite it correctly. Right? So we just finished discussing a common primary source in class. Uh, I'm going to take five minutes now, take out a piece of paper, summarize this source in three sentences and cite it appropriately for our discipline and turn that in on the way out. And then I grade that check, check, uh, no check type of assignment. Uh, we can discuss what makes for a good thesis statement and then practice. Write your thesis statement. If you were going to turn your paper in on Friday, what would your thesis statement be right now? It could change before you actually turn it in, but what would it be now? And then we're going to swap them and critique them. What does it take to make a good thesis statement? Uh, you can look at this bigger picture and synthesis things. Uh, write a letter to a friend, right? So we just finished a discussion about all these different pieces that we've been reading about for the last month, right? trying to pull it all together. So I want you to sit down and write a letter to your friend in which you explain what you've learned, how it's important to the field, what you find interesting about it, and how it relates to what you're studying. Right? So you're synthesizing disparate pieces of information and bringing them together in an informal way, but you're getting that practice. You can also do required summaries, right? those uh, little three-page essays I was requiring in my methods class. That's a really nice way to give them practice with summary and analysis. Right? So summarize in one page and then spend a page analyzing strength and weaknesses of the argument, or uh, analyzing how this fits into this larger whole that we've been discussing as a class. That's really important because it gives you the chance to talk about the difference between summary and analysis. And that's one of those places that, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of our incoming freshmen and incoming community college students, they've been trained to think that a good paper is one that regurgitates what they've read, not to take that next step to analysis. So the goal in doing all these is to practice the skills in a low stakes way. And the reason you want to do it in a low stakes way is that students are a lot less likely to plagiarize something that's worth 0 to 10% of their grade than they are to plagiarize something that's worth 35%. I'll take the risk. Maybe I'll fail, but if I fail, it's only worth like five points, so, you know, no big deal. It's not worth plagiarizing. It also then gives them a chance to practice. Um, you have to make it worth something to make them do it again. Uh, so whether that's participation points, whether that's a sort of check, check, minus thing, uh, you can tie it into that scaffolding uh, that we were talking about earlier and make it part of that. Um, you can give them the peer pressure, right? Tell them ahead of time, you're going to bring summaries, and at the start of class, we're going to swap summaries and have pair share square on summaries. Um, and then they've got the peer pressure of if I come in without something, everybody's going to know, and I'm going to let my classmates down. Sometimes that works. Um, sometimes that backfires on you, and they all decide not to do it, so you know, use caution. Uh, but it's another way to go. 
The key here, though, again, is to give them feedback on these assignments so that they can learn from their mistakes. So when they get to the high stakes assignment, they actually know what to do. They feel comfortable doing all of it. Another thing that can help here uh, is when you give that feedback, invite the students to participate in metacognition. You know, things didn't go so well for you on that summary paper. Why not? What went wrong? Okay. Where, where did you fail? Did you not give yourself enough time to write the paper? Maybe you need to think about planning. Uh, did you not understand the difference between summary and analysis? Right? Maybe you need to think about that. Uh, in biology, right, for the test, did you not understand the difference between having the factual definitions and being able to talk about the concepts? Right? Um, you know, that's a very different step. So that kind of metacognition allows them to then reflect on, that's what I did wrong, maybe I need to change that, and I'm going to try changing it for the next small little risk assignment and see what happens. Those are my suggestions for how to design plagiarism assignments. The last couple steps uh, that I mentioned for trying to plagiarism proof your class as best as possible uh, is to evaluate your cases carefully when they come up and then to actually follow through on consequences for those that are plagiarism. Before you follow through on consequences, though, you need to decide if it's plagiarism. Uh, and here is where I would encourage you to distinguish between plagiarism and accidental misattribution and traditional painter hall sound uh, barriers coming up. <coughs> so, uh, if students attempted to use their sources correctly, I really, really encourage you not to charge them with full plagiarism. If they made the attempt but they missed one, or they cited it badly or incompletely, right, your style requires them to include a page number and they didn't, uh, or they used the wrong person's name, right, they mixed up their sources, um, you don't necessarily assume that they're doing it to hide the fact that they stole that sentence from the internet and they just put a person's name on it. If you find the sentence on the internet, call them on it. Um, but if it looks like they did it by accident, you know, talk to them about it. This is certainly, especially the case with summary, which as we know, summary and paraphrasing is the hardest thing to do correctly. Make that a learning moment. Instead of making that a moment for punishment, make it a learning moment. That doesn't mean that you just let them get away with it, right? have to actually make them learn from it. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. Um, some options would include requiring revisions. I noticed in your paper that you had a lot of citation errors, a lot of places where you didn't cite appropriately, your summary was inaccurate. I want you to revise that and turn it into me uh, in a week's time. If you're worried that they're not going to do that, tie their grade to the revisions, right? For the moment, you have a zero. You will not have a zero after you turn it into me with the corrections made. When you turn it in with the corrections made, you'll get the grade that otherwise it would have gotten. Here's what that would be. Um, but if you don't get the corrections to me, the zero will hold. Uh, otherwise, you could also maybe make a limit to how many times you can do this. Right? If they do it consistently, you get three chances. You get two chances. You get one chance uh, to make those mistakes early on. If you make mistakes after that, then I'm going to consider it a plagiarism case and I'm going to report it for you. You get three strikes sort of rule. Uh, and attempts to do revisions before I institute that policy. Whatever you're comfortable with, but you have to have some sort of backup on that. You know, telling them you did this incorrectly, and they say, oh, well, I did this correctly, and they took you know, a couple points out of the assignment. I'm fine with that. Make them actually follow up. The goal here is to educate your students about how to actually properly attribute the material so they don't do it wrong when the higher stakes are there, uh, and that they don't then slip into the larger levels of plagiarism. If I don't get called on the small things, or if I get called on it but there's no consequences, then I might just start pushing that line a little further and a little further and a little further, and before long, I'm just copying wholesale paragraphs off the internet. Uh, I have a surprise roll, so then I get called on If you suspect plagiarism in one of your classes, um, you should, of course, follow whatever your departmental or college protocol is uh, in terms of following up. Whatever I say here does not suit Go with what your department tells you to do. But if your department policy starts with a meeting with the student, I encourage you to ask the student to bring along evidence of work they've done building that time. Bring the articles that you read that you made notes on. Bring an outline. Bring a draft. Show me proof that you were working your way through this so that I can see, yeah, she really did probably slip up and forget to cite this source because she really did read it and think about it and analyze it and you know, move pieces around with it. Versus if you can't show me a lick of evidence that you tried to do something, then I'm going to be pretty tempted to believe you really did copy it for sale off the internet, uh, and I'm going to have a little less sympathy. Scaffolded assignments can help you there, because you should have a trail of breadcrumbs taking you back to the beginning. 
Um, the last thing I want to mention in terms of talking about evaluating cases is to be careful if you choose to use plagiarism detection software. Um, I should preface this by saying that I am not a fan of plagiarism detection software, uh, but I hope that after I explain why, you will join me in not being a fan of this stuff. Uh, for one, it's not very reliable. Uh, it's not always accurate. There's been a couple studies that show that experienced faculty members armed only with Google can more accurately and reliably detect plagiarism than things like Turnitin, Safe Assign, uh, software like that. So it's not any more reliable than you are using Google. Second, what that software actually does for students is it teaches them how to be better plagiarizers. Uh, if you upload a paper into Safe Assign or Turnitin, do you ever see what happens? So you upload the paper into Safe Assign or Turnitin, which is not in the back, this is also fairly astute. Uh, it will, if you're a nice faculty member trying to use all the tools, right? it has the, the teach mode, right? And so the teach mode, you upload your paper and it says, your paper is 40% plagiarized. This is bad. And it highlights in red all the places that Turnitin finds that you have copied material, right? And if that's not in quotation marks with the, the, the source after it, then you're like, oh, well, that's bad. So my options are, if I'm a good student, I'm going to go in, I'm going to rewrite my paper, and I'm going to fix all of that. If I'm lazy, pressed for time, or just don't care, what I can do is go in and change a word here and there, do a couple synonyms, move that phrase over here, that one down there, upload it again. Oh, it's gone from 40 down to 20. Do a couple more times, and now it's down to 10. I'm good with that, and I submit it. So it just teaches you to be a better plagiarizer. Uh, it does not teach you how to not plagiarize. <coughs> Another problem uh, with that software is the ownership. Level. Um, the way that Turnitin at least works is, uh, if you read their, their, their legalese, they retain very murky ownership rights of anything that's submitted. Because the way they build their database to check stuff against is that everything you send in, they maintain. And they hold it in their database and they check everything that's subsequently turned in against everything they get. It makes sense. Right? That's how they build their database and that's how they sell themselves is better than the internet because not everything ends up on the internet. Right? Those paper mills that are off the internet harder to track. The problem is that's a little murky in terms of ownership. So say for a student in the creative writing program who actually owns that work, if they're required to submit it to turn it in and then they want to publish it later, that's a little bit of a gray area legally. Um, same thing for say a student who wants to present their work at a conference or to submit it to an academic journal publication. It's a little iffy to me to have their student partially owned by turn it in. It's, it's just uh, always making me a little nervous. Uh, if none of those reasons are good enough for you to avoid it, then I have the ultimate reason, which is that we no longer have access to it. Uh, um, we used to have access in Blackboard to Safe Aside because that was their proprietary software and it came with the system. In Canvas, we don't. Um, we looked into buying Turnitin for everyone, but it is outrageously expensive and I don't think the software is worth it, so we don't have it. Uh, so if you still want to use that kind of software, by all means do, just be aware of its limitations and be aware that you're going to have to find a way to do it uh, without the university subscription. If, in the end, unfortunately, you do discover that a student has plagiarized in your class, it's still going to happen, hopefully, a lot rarer, uh, more, less frequently uh, with this kind of system, but it will still happen. Follow through. Please, please, please do follow through with the statement in your syllabus about the consequences that you need to use for plagiarism. The official W policy is that if a student commits plagiarism, they get a zero for the assignment. Uh, you are supposed to report that student in writing to your chair, then your dean and the provost goes up the line. Um, the student can appeal that process at any point in time uh, off the chain as well. If it's the student's first offense, then nothing happens. It just goes on record in the provost's office unless it was particularly flagrant. Uh, flagrant is kind of an open term, but in general we're talking like fought. Uh, if they commit a second or further offense, then they get called before the Academic Standards Board uh, and they are evaluated with possible further repercussions. So, in general, please follow through. Uh, whether you stick just to that policy or you want to institute more, um, the minimum is a zero for the assignment. You can also, though, decide to put your policy, um, you know, if you plagiarize on this last major research paper, you automatically fail the class. To do that. Whatever your policy is, follow through. Following through is important because this is the best tool we have for getting at those students who don't fear the consequences of it. 
if we don't follow through, then they have no reason to believe that we're going to do it. Right? So it's just like uh, with a three-year-old. Right? If you say, I'm going to put you in time out, if you do that again, and then you don't, well, then of course they keep doing it. Um, you have to actually follow through. Um, now, there are certainly times where something is murky enough that you don't want to. I understand that. There are times when you are so overwhelmed, the last thing you want to do is pile up other players in the case. I completely understand that, too. I have been there. Hopefully, what this process does, though, is limit the number of cases you get to a small enough amount that it's manageable when one pops up every once in a while. Another reason I want to encourage you to actually submit them is that not following through on plagiarism cases hurts you and hurts the university in multiple ways. Um, it hurts your colleagues because it means that the person learns they can get away with it and they just carry the behavior forward. So, you don't call them on it, which means that next semester somebody else might have to call them on it or not call them on it, and it's just going to keep going from there. It hurts the students, right? Obviously, it hurts the students who is the student who is plagiarizing because they're not getting called on it. They might not know uh, if they know full well what they did, then it's teaching them they can get away with it, uh, and it's short shaping them for all of those reasons we talked about earlier in terms of um, learning skills, learning analysis, learning the ability to think for themselves. It's setting them up basically for future failure, both here in the university when somebody finally does call them on it, and in life when they don't actually have those skills to draw on. And finally, it hurts the university, right? It, it hurts uh, our academic standards. It causes our academic integrity to slide in the hole. Um, so maintaining that line and trying to call students on it when we see it um, is something that we all can do to try to support that overall mission. That is what I have to say. And questions, further ideas, concerns that this is totally unmanageable. Thoughts? I feel like I've worked far too much here. It's very bad. Well, thank you for coming out and for putting up with the construction noise. That was bad accidental timing. I guess the glass guys showed up today with no warning and said, we're fixing your windows. But thank you for coming out.